Floyd Banks and this motherfucker. Watch this. Watch this. We did a lot more than heat up the game. I feel we flammable. Empty the clip like keep the change. You filthy animal. They built a cannibal. Tell the killers, come chill with Hannibal. So much metal stuck in my hands, it feel mechanical. The wrath of Satan, decapitation and lacerations. The burner shape could turn murder mason, a pastor mason. These rappers hating, I ain't moving the First thing I want to say is obviously thank you for coming on, bro. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Yeah, no doubt. Um, first thing I want to ask you. So, uh, you're originally uh from Harlem, right? Yes. Yep. So, how was it over there while while you were growing up? Like, um, how was the area you were in growing up, and what were you kind of hearing as you were a kid, like music wise? Like, what were you hearing as you were growing up, like from elementary school up to high school? Uh, well, first, um, Harlem. It wasn't a good area. Um. I lived on 140th and Lennox, um, like a block away from like Big L. Yeah, shout that's, out to Big L. Um, a lot of people that's familiar with Harlem know that, you know, back in like, you know, the early to late 90s, that was, you know, that was a rough area to be in. Um, so, you know, it wasn't like the safest spot. I didn't always have like the luxury of being able to, you know, be outside by myself and playing and stuff. There was like a lot of, you know, shootings and all, all that kind of stuff um, in the area. Um but um, around that time, to be honest, I wasn't I like I knew of hip hop and I listened when when I found time to. But I, I wasn't really allowed to listen to uh, hip hop mm-hmm. while I was younger. My mom, she didn't really want me to listen to it because obviously, you know, like the subject matter. But, you know, living in Harlem, I had uh, two older brothers that listened to it. You know, it, it got to my ears either way. But um, uh, initially I would hear whatever they were listening to while my mom wasn't home. Um, things that my friends would listen to and just stuff on the radio and things like that. But um, I always also listened to a lot of other stuff too. Um, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just hip hop. Yeah, for sure. So once you get out of that phase, right? Like, you know, that's how I was too. My parents were kind of controlling, you know, the hip hop in our household. And um, so once you get to like high school and stuff, uh, what are you listening to then? Like, who are some of your influences? Yeah, high school is different. Um, <clears throat> I listened to a lot of, um, like the, the classic up north rappers like the Locks, Nas, um, Jay Z. But actually, I went to high school in Florida, um, so I actually listened to a lot of like you know down south artists too. I was a big like um, like Ludacris fan. I even used to listen to like Little John when they were on their run with the Little John and the East Side Boys. Um, and, um, you know, there was that um, phase where kind of like everything down south started to take over, just hip hop in general in Atlanta. Um, so I was I listened to a lot. Um, but um, when I actually kind of took it upon my own to listen to hip hop and my mom, you know, she wasn't as strict. Um, it was a lot of like Nas, like Rough Riders, like and then it kind of transitioned more into um, as I was down south, it transitioned more to like people like Ludacris. GZ and then you know and so forth. Yeah, so after so after that time, right? You you're growing up. When when does it occur to you like when do you start messing around with, you know, getting involved in making music? Like when's the first time you you know like produced anything or even attempted to or even thought about it? So, I actually had the program Fruity Loop since I was um I think I was like 14, 15. I kind of just had it. It was more like a, a app on a computer. That I, I kind of considered a game. I would, you know, mess around with it here and there. But um, like my uh, my brother, like he rapped in like a talent show. Um, and he actually rapped over his own beats. So we both kind of, you know, here and there we made beats, but you know, we weren't taking it like you know super serious as far as like trying to be professional or anything like that. We were still focused on um basketball but I guess I made my first few beats around it's like the time of 14 15 and I took like a break uh from it for a while I didn't really get back into um the actual creation part of music for a while like I said because you know we were focused on um you know basketball and things like that playing all through high school and a, and a little bit in uh college so um I would say fairly early, but I wasn't, you know, at the time that I first made my beats, I never would have imagined that, you know, I'd be uh, a producer. That would be, you know, one of my uh, 
alternative lifelong goals. Yeah, for sure. So, so when was it, what year was it when you, when you like locked in and you were like, okay, like this is, I think I can do this. Um, Actually that was like 2011, 2012, around like 2011, I got back um into making beats and um my friend who I was living with at the time, uh, Corey, he was always telling me to um, like, you know, put your stuff out there, let people hear it. Other people thought so too. Um, so I would just put, um, I would just put stuff on at the time. It was like SoundCloud and things like that. And I actually started to get like, um, local artists and stuff reaching out, um, saying like, Oh, like, can we get your beats? And, you know, how do we go about getting beats? And at that time I wasn't even really putting them out expecting like, you know, artists to reach out and want to use them. It was just, um, you know, really for them to be heard. Um, and at that point I started to realize that, you know, I was like progressively getting better and that, you know, um, I had an ear and was able to match like, you know, sounds from different eras and things like that. So around then, that's when I started to, um, you know, take it, take it seriously, gave myself, uh, you know, a producer name and uh, really didn't look back since 2012. I mean, between then and now, I had like a, a brief period um, where, you know, it was like a little bit slower, took like, you know, little breaks here and there just throughout the, you know, the natural frustrations of music and stuff like that. But Definitely around 2012 was where I decided that I want to try to pursue this um, uh, professionally. Yeah. Is there a certain moment in your mind, like, because if we just go through, let's just say this year, right? Obviously, you know, you're killing it right now. You d- you're you on the Thank Lloyd you. Banks album, you and RJ Payne, you have the song with um with Dave East, you're on Jacquees' album, um, Heem's album. Is there a moment in your mind, like, what what, what was the I made it moment, Connor? Or maybe not even the I made it, just like, oh, I think I can actually, you know, I can do this professionally. Um, It actually was back in 2012, because the second I started to take it seriously, I used um social media to get in touch with a lot of people. Um, but I think the first big artist I got in touch with at the time was uh, like Dricky Graham as uh, the song Snapbacks and Tattoos was blowing up. Um, so I caught him right at this time, like that started like blowing up and when it went like platinum and I did some work, I had like two songs on, um, like his mixtape he did with DJ Ill Will. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from there, I kind of piggybacked off of that. I I really just used Twitter to get in contact with people. I got people like in touch with artists like, um, like Roscoe Dash, uh, the producer drummer boy did a song with DJ Paul that I produced. Um, and I just kind of just I started building from there. But once I realized that was at the time where, um, you know, it was kind of a little bit easier email, but it was harder. Like they would post their email um, to their profile. Obviously, they got like 50,000 plus followers yeah. and producers would send. And I noticed that um, I would like be on top of that. And I noticed that when I would send and I know like the the bigger artists got to hear, I would you I would start to hear back. So it was at that point that I knew that they were hearing something, obviously where they felt like, you know, the quality was up there. So at that point, I was just like, okay, so if I, you know, if I keep progressing with this and um and just finding a way to get the contacts and I could really make something of it. Yeah. How how did you get in contact with uh, RJ Payne? Because it seems like you kind of got with him, you know, like I wouldn't say he's fully mainstream yet, but he's hot now. Like if you, if you know, you know, you know what I mean? And, Definitely. Uh, it kind of sounds like you got with him right at the perfect time, right before, you know, he, he took it to the next level. Um, yeah, I would, I guess, I, I guess you can say that, uh, he was like, right. Um, by the time I found out about him, he already had like multiple clips that went viral and things like that. Um, but, uh, I forgot how exactly I came across him, but I just reached out to him. I believe it was on Twitter first. And, um, I was like, yo, definitely want to send you like some beats um, at that point, I decided to kind of switch up because I, I started originally as um, like a a trap producer in 2012. That's when I was taking it seriously. That's what I was. Um, that's mainly what I was focusing on. But over like the last three to four years, I focused more on like the traditional hip hop. I found some of those artists were a little bit easier to reach, and I'm an adaptable producer, so I can really produce in in any genre. As you know, and as my career goes on, people will start to see that. But R.J. Payne, I found on Twitter. I got in touch with him. I'm trying to remember if that was before or after I first got in touch with Lloyd Banks. It might have been a little bit after, but the first um, Lloyd Banks return album 
I don't think that had um, released yet, but I got in touch with him. So I'm pretty much sending him and Lloyd Banks beats um, all at the same time. And um, as of right now, those are pretty much like two of the artists that I, uh, I work like the closest with and the most consistently with. I have like the biggest discographies um, with them. I have like, you know, multiple, obviously multiple songs with RJ Payne. And in the last, I think, three years, I'm up to, I think, 18 songs with like Lloyd Banks, uh, 19 if you count the song that uh, Lloyd Banks and RJ Payne did together. So I kind of started building with them both around the same time. Yeah, I was going to say that because with you and Lloyd lately, you, you're up to like almost 20 songs with him. And then I just think like the whatever you and RJ Payne have going is like magic. You know, it's kind of like a hit boy Nas situation, how I look at it. You know, like his biggest songs you produce, him and Lloyd. And then like also you have other people on the tracks now, like huge names like Method Man, Inspector Deck. Um, so do you do you get excited as a fan or is it just work to you when you see like when you get something set back to you and you're like holy shit like method man's on my song you know what i mean no absolutely as a fan of music and hip-hop um it's hard it's hard not to you know if you truly appreciate what you're doing it's hard not to be excited about things like that like when i first got the you know the lloyd banks placement like the hunger for more album like highlighted like you know two years of high school for me um, so, and obviously, you know, the, how big the G unit era was, and I was a huge, you know, 50 cent Lloyd Banks, like G unit, Eminem, those were like, you know, those are like my version of like, you know, like the, the Michael Jackson's of like hip hop and everything like that at that time. So the, um, you know, when I first got a placement with him, I was like, wow, you know, and I was looking forward to it. And it was, um, kind of crazy to hear like, um, like a legend like himself, um, on like my beat. And, it, and not just that, for it to sound as good like as it did, it, it was just crazy to be, you know, be a part of that. But same thing with um, getting verses and features from people like Method Man, like Ice T and, and Bun B. Like these are, um, like these are huge names in hip hop. So, you know, as a as a fan first, I'm always excited when I when I know one of them is going to be, you know, on a on a, a song that I produce, and you know, it definitely makes um. It makes it uh, more worthwhile as a fan, you know, outside of the business um, aspect. And, you know, it's, it's definitely a cool thing. Yeah. How does that work, like, from a producer's point of view, like, behind the scenes? Like, is it kind of you just send the beat over to RJ and his team kind of, you know, they get the features and then they just send, like, you just hear, like, oh, like, do they just be like, hit you up and be like, oh, we're going to use your beat for this song? Like, do you, do you have any control over that part once once they accept the beat or? Um, in some cases, you kind of got to build up to that, though. Like first, yeah. even like with Lloyd Banks, like I wasn't sure like who he's going to put on it or how it's going to, you know, how it's going to go. Um, Same thing with RJ. But as I developed like relationships with them, you know, we kept in touch during the creative process. Um, So RJ, he'll be like, oh, yeah, he'll tell me like beforehand, like, oh, we got this record. I'm thinking about putting this person on it. But Lloyd Banks is kind of. um it's pretty much the same thing, you know, it takes a, it takes a little bit. You got to build up, you know, the relationship with the artist because, you know, sometimes, um, you know, they get a one beat from a producer they never end up really working again. And that's kind of it. Luckily I'm in the position where, you know, I'm getting like multiple with, uh, with, with artists like that. So we have, you know, it, it allows the groundwork for us to be able to build working relationships. That's also creative to where, you know, they're more open to, to sharing, letting you know, saying, hey, how do you think this person might sound in it? Or do you have anybody in mind? So I think that's also a cool part too to um, you know, to be um in that in that creative process with the artist. Yeah, that must be dope from your perspective, like, you know, just starting out by like sending them a beat and then over time, like like with Lloyd, like now you have almost 20 songs with him. Like you guys must have a good relationship for him to keep going through, you know. Um, yeah, that's gotta be dope. Just like that, that being your job and like, you know how it is, like when you're a hip hop fan, like, like Lloyd Banks, especially in New York, like he's a fucking legend. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like you, you know, you, you grew up there. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's what I was like saying, like before, like, you know, um, to end up with, um, you know, him on for a lot of people that grew up in New York. 
um, you know, just to just to, to get a placement with with him is is a big deal just because he's part of kind of like almost like your upbringing and what you listen to. But, you know, for me to have, you know, the extensive um, amount of like discography with him to where, you know, I was a big part of, you know, his his uh, his return to hip hop. And I had a heavy presence on one on the first one. I had three second one. I had eight. And on thir the third installment of Cody, I had like seven. So the last two I did, um, I did pretty much like half both of his albums. And, you know, that's it's just a good feeling. And, and it just lets you know that, um, or lets me know that, you know, to, to keep going. And I'm sending him the right stuff. And, you know, he definitely has it here for my beats. And, you know, it's, it's just good work in uh, music chemistry. Yeah, I, I definitely feel, and I get it where you're coming from, too, because I'm originally from New Jersey. So I'm... You know, I'm like right in Jersey City, right across the bridge. So I'm kind of listening to everything that you guys are listening to. And um, yeah, with Lloyd, like you can tell like the three albums you produced on, like he's back and he he's, he, you know, he's some people might say he's rapping better now than before. I like it's crazy because like listening, like I hear like the contrast, like, you know, back in the day, he was like the PLK, the Punchline King, which if people listen close enough, he still is. Yeah. Um, he is. But he's mixing like a lot of more like introspective stuff into his music about like life and stuff. And I think that's good. I think hip hop is missing that because there's so much, um, I don't know, there's so much like ageism. And I think this year that's been like a, a huge topic, ageism in hip hop. And it's like, you know, it's a lot of it is because it puts like older rappers in a space where they feel like, you know, to be relevant, they kind of have to rap about the same things they did when they were like 20. And it's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, you can still be, um, you can, you know, I, th I think you can still showcase your, your abilities as an MC rapping about life and regular things that late people in their late 30s and, and 40s deal with. Because there's people in their late 30s and 40s that listen to, to um, music and then there's still younger people too so um, I think you know that that definitely has been like a, a, a big topic in hip-hop it seems this year with it being a, the 50-year anniversary yeah I think that concert um, at Yankee Stadium really proved like I don't think the age thing like that was a big topic too and like people were like oh if you're over 30 40 like quit it you know but like after seeing that and you know, Lloyd putting out what he's putting out, Nas and what Hit Boy are doing, like right. you, you really can't argue it anymore. You know what I mean? And you see them, they killed the stage. Like it's not like they don't have the presence. And also, like, I don't know, you probably saw the tweet by Ice T last week. Like yep. you have all these older rappers selling out tours around the country and like the hottest new rappers, you know, they're dropping a lot of dates. I mean, he's he's right about that. I think there's a lot of different factors into that. Like a lot of the newer rappers, their fans are are streaming fans. So I feel like, you know, some of the fans are a little bit spoiled in being able to have music at the click of, you know, their thumbs. Whereas to like when, you know, I was like a kid, you had to go to the store, you had to buy a CD and you kind of really grew. Like you had to commit to it. You know, you, you didn't just listen to it one time and then, like you know just slide over to the next uh, album on your iphone you bought it you invested in it so even if you didn't catch everything on the first listen you listened through till it grew on you so the dedication was different i remember like times where cds would sell out and people waiting online so a lot of the artists that are you know doing their thing right now hip hop 50 they're from that era so their fans are loyal they're gonna go to their shows they're gonna you know they're gonna pay for like you know their music and it might not be in the masses and numbers that it is for like artists like Drake and Lil Baby, but you know, they still have um they still have loyal fan bases. And I think that's a, a beautiful thing for hip hop. I think, you know, some of the ageism does need to stop. I'd love to see more of the older legends collaborate with um the new people. And I think, you know, all it's only gonna cause, you know, more exponential growth for hip hop as a whole. And it does like you it there's uh you there's a way you can be competitive without you know trying to cut each other's heads off and and hindering like the growth of hip-hop as a genre yeah no i completely agree with you um next thing i wanted to ask you um who, who would you say um or some let's say like five like who who are your five like favorite producers personally oh man this is this changes like so 
so much for me again because I listened to so many. Yeah, me too. But, um, if I'm going back with where around like the time that I really decided to take it serious, it was like 2012. I always say Southside and Lex Luger because I know they use like FL Studio and they really like they pioneered a lot. They, you know, they kind of uh, I know there's other producers that use that and started, but at least like to me, they were the, the two like most visible um, artists at that time using that software, the computer right from your home, being able to make um, beats. So um, there's two um Timbaland, definitely one. Oh man, there's so many. Just to name five is tough. Um, who did I say? I said Southside, Lex Luger, Timbaland. Let's see. Um, people like uh, I'd have to say like a like a, a four a four um a four spot tie between like. A, a DJ premiere and like a large professor, like, you know, them, because mm -hmm. they're, they like, you know, they embodied like the, the soul of like the, um, like traditional hip hop and things like that. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to mix it up because I got, I got a couple trap producers. I got, um, boom bap producers. Um, I don't know. I got, like I said, I got uh, like people like Timberland, Scott Storch. Like I, I listen to such a variety of music. Yeah, there's so many I, good ones to choose too. Yeah, and and the thing is, I don't like I like producers that like Timberland is by far one of my favorites because like he's so far out of the box that you know like his sound actually can't be recreated. Like you know, yeah. he's he's one of the few producers to where like if I was like I'm gonna make a a, a Timberland type beat. You would have <laughs> to, it, yeah. you can't really, like, how would you do that? Because he's, you know, he's so abstract. Um, but yeah, he's definitely one of the ghosts. But yeah, there's a lot of producers that I, I, um, you know, I admire and respect that growing up. Yeah, I always ask everyone, um, every artist that comes on this podcast, and um, for you as a producer, I'm really interested in what you're going to say. Um, who would three dream features on a track for you be, like, dead or alive? You could pick any three. Oh man, um, like all on one track or on separate tracks? Oh no, it could be separately. Um, and just who we were three people like, if you if it was a perfect world, you could pick a dead or alive artist. Oh, even that three is tough, but yeah, I gotta I say, I gotta say Drake, I gotta mm -hmm. say Kendrick, and then I'm gonna cheat and say a, a tie between Nas and Cole for uh for number three. But yeah, yeah, those are those are three people that I'd, uh four people that I would love to um you know to work with and um you know hopefully hopefully in uh the future that can happen. But um yeah, they like I I love all of their music. I've I've listened to all of them um like since you know since I was since I was younger. So definitely definitely them. Yeah. Um, so for you being a producer, right, I, I hear this a lot with artists. Um, I'm wondering if it's the same for producers. Um, has your ear changed since you went from being a fan to in the industry? Like, because I, I, I can listen to music and like I still hear it just as the same if I was like 10 years old. You know what I mean? Like, it, like you can hear all the other. Th I know a lot of artists like say they have trouble, you know, listening to music like it's not the same. How is it for you? Um, like, do you like critique everything extra? Like when you when you listen to a record, or I don't really critique it. Um, I still listen the same, but I will say I listen a little bit less because I find myself in particular creative like places. Like for example, if I'm working on, um, you know, finishing out a project with like Lloyd Banks, um, if I find myself listening to like the new Lil Dirk, Lil Baby and all that other stuff, if I do that, like, too often, um, I feel like, um, not by, like, not by a lot, but it kind of, it can kind of change a little bit of your creative perspective, so, like, when I'm fully locked in, focusing on, like, a project I'm working on, I actually don't listen to a ton of, um, of music that's out, I mean, if there's, if there's, like, a huge release that comes out, I'll try to, like, you know, check it out and listen to, like, something here and there, but, um, when I'm in like a mode and working on or towards like something, I try to stay in that mode. So I'd say that's the, been the biggest change since, 
you know, starting to become, you know, more involved in the industry is just listening to music a lot less and then just creating it a lot more and then listening, you know, to what I'm doing. But every now and then, um, as a just as a creative, I have to stop and make sure I'm listening to to some new music to give me different creative um ideas and just bring me to different places. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that's a great answer, bro. I really appreciate uh your perspective of someone, you know, who's actually behind the boards making the music. Um, before you get out of here, bro, uh, what's next for you? Like, what can we expect from you? What can your fans look forward to? Um, what what's coming up? Saying like, you know, the next few months to a year. Oh man, um, I know you might not be able to spoil certain things too. Um, it's definitely a lot. Let's um and and right like this is what I have confirmed. Like at least for like for October, I'm gonna be on I think like four to five different projects from like a, a a lot of different people I'm I'm working on stuff now obviously still sending like RJ Banks um sending Method Man stuff uh Red Cafe um so like I'm I'm working with uh Deontay Hitchcock from Atlanta there's just so many people that I'm sending stuff and um before like before the year's up, it's gonna like the the first half of this year I had like a flurry where for like two months there was like project after project after project and there's gonna be another one in uh, within the next three months for sure. Um so it's, it's gonna be a lot of uh, definitely a lot of new music uh to look forward to. And it, and I don't think it's all gonna be the, the same. It's not gonna be what people expect either. It's not all the traditional hip hop and boom bap. So I'm probably most excited for people to hear you know, my different kinds of production. That's great, bro. And uh, yeah, I want to thank you for coming on, bro. And I, I'm a huge fan. And uh, like I said, I'm always going to tap into everything you're doing and gladly promote it. And uh, while I have you face to face, bro, I definitely want to give you your flowers, you know, just um, especially in this hip hop thing, just pushing it forward. And um, I, I told everyone before you come on, like, check his shit out now because in a few years like I, I know you're gonna be up there so i appreciate you coming on bro and uh hopefully we could do this again in the future hey uh definitely that we definitely can and, and thanks again for having me i appreciate it uh you asked some, some some good questions and you know looking forward to seeing you grow um you know you grow your platform as well so i definitely appreciate it i appreciate you bro stay safe and uh we'll be looking for what you're doing all right thanks man take care you too boss